Yeah, okay, cool. Everybody can see my screen. Okay. Cool. All right. <clears throat> well, first of all, I just want to say thanks for coming, everyone. It was nice to kind of have an extended introduction um, and get to know what people are thinking about. Um, and some of the stuff that was mentioned in the introduction is kind of relevant to the topic of the talk. Um, yeah. And I guess to introduce myself, uh, I've been working at Life Itself for, I guess, a month and a half. Um, and I'm about to graduate with a degree in urban studies. And I also do research on complex adaptive systems at a research center called CLEA. So we're kind of interested in how, mostly in the language and the modeling tools for complex adaptive systems, I guess, is like the easiest way to put it. Um, and the kinds of complex adaptive systems that I'm particularly interested in are cities and trying to kind of understand how cities work and the feedback mechanisms in cities work, which is pretty impossible. <laughs> So, uh, which is partly why I chose this as a, as a topic to talk about today. Um, so yeah, thanks again for, for coming everyone. And I guess we'll get into it. Um, so the topic is kind of on embracing uncertainty, especially as it relates to transdisciplinarity. Um, just to, I guess a quick show of hands, is anyone familiar with what transdisciplinary research kind of is what it's like aims are um is it more so like a buzzword for you guys or is anyone um kind of more familiar with it uh i actually no idea, <laughs> no idea. okay 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 cool um so i will talk about it a little bit um in this and the way i'm going to do that is basically just reference what i think is interesting or who is writing good papers in this area or what these good, what these papers look like. So I think I'll probably have like four sources and I could give a little bit of a rough background as to like what it kind of is as well. Um, and it'll especially be in relation to uncertainty and what uncertainty kind of means in this transdisciplinary space. Um, yeah, and then I guess at the end it'll, kind of go into some specific questions as to how this can be applied or kind of just raise some specific questions and feel free at any time as well to kind of butt in and say whatever. I'm not a, you can just talk, like you don't have to raise your hand or anything. Um, feel free to butt in and ask a question if something doesn't make sense, or if you have a question or a comment that you think is, that's kind of, you know, you find, you need to say it, like definitely feel free to, to speak up. Um, so what do we mean by uncertainty or what do I mean by uncertainty? Pretty straightforward, just not being certain about something. Um, yeah, not too much ambiguity there. Um, I kind of wanted to just open up with a few quotes to kind of just uh, get things started. Um, as it relates to kind of uncertainty and not knowing uh, this, because there, I think there are some nice quotes and uncertainty is kind of like a, a really broad topic, or I think it has a lot of different dimensions. And I think these quotes kind of introduce the different dimensions of uncertainty a little bit. <clears throat> so, yeah, the only, I'll just read them, I guess. The only thing that makes life possible is permanent, intolerable uncertainty, not knowing what comes next. And I think this one in particular is pretty just, it's a pretty just interesting, it, it could serve as like an interesting quote to meditate on actually, because the next moment, and this isn't really the, the topic of the talk, but the next moment is always kind of uncertain to some degree. Um, this is more so the topic of the talk, uh, this quote, kind of what this is introducing. Uh, to think you know when you do not is a disease, to recognize it is to be free of this disease. Um, and I think kind of the aim of transdisciplinary uh, research at this point is to figure out what we don't know um, or what cannot, what we can't really be certain of because a lot of disciplines 
scientific disciplines, especially, claim to be uh, very certain about certain things. And I think transdisciplinary research kind of really challenges that idea. Um, this one I just kind of liked, and it's also, it kind of has to do with uncertainty. The truth of a thing is in the feel of it, not to think of it. Stanley Kubrick. Uh, this quote in particular has always come back to me. I think it's just really, really interesting. And Lumen in particular is always somebody who I come back to. And it's like, I see him new so many different times. Like he says something and I don't get it. And then I kind of come back to him and he kind of, I always learn from this guy. He's really, really interesting. And this quote is kind of always stuck with me. The truth is lived, not taught. Somebody said that. Um, quantum mechanics makes absolutely no sense. It's kind of true in, in to some degree. I'm not. I'm not a. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm particularly well versed in like quantum mechanics, but it's or qu like quantum physics generally. But it's kind of interesting how somebody at the at the who kind of really pioneered this field would, would say something like that. Um, what we know is a drop, what we don't know is the ocean on the other side of the scientific spectrum, I guess. Um, and then this last one, it is uncertainty that charms, a mist that makes things wonderful. So I think all these quotes kind of point to the different dimensions of uncertainty. And I think the one that Lao Tzu, or the one that Lao Tzu said about like not knowing is to be, or know, thinking you know when you don't is a sort of like disease. And then overcoming that is kind of being free of that disease. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect. And there was a talk, which I will put in the comments as well, um, that one of my fellow researchers did where he kind of argued that there's a Dunning-Kruger effect at more, like a social scale. Um, and I think this really like simple graph kind of illustrates the degree to which, and it, he argued that it is happening on like this wider cultural scale. But I do think that this diagram really does to some degree point to an interesting, a potentially interesting cultural kind of mindset or and of course there's no such thing as like one cultural mindset but um generally speaking it's kind of this idea that we the dunning-kruger effect is like this idea where we think we know how to do something and i i this happens with in our own lives on like so many different scales like if you start playing a sport or like let's say you like start reading about one topic like you suddenly get into like contemporary like Chinese politics or something and you think like you read one book and you're like yeah I know so much about this like I'm practically an expert and then there's a certain point where you're like you really know you really don't know anything and the, the 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 funny thing here too is that the less you know the kind of more confidence you think you have and I think like the U.S. is the generally speaking like the perfect example of the Dunning Kruger effect, where they they're so confident that they know how to uh, kind of govern things, or they they think their model is so effective and well-meaning, and you know embraces freedom and liberty and all this stuff. But I would say that it is kind of like at the peak of Mount Stupid. Like the the less you know. And the more confidence you have are kind of interrelated in the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, and so the the argument that my uh, colleague did was basically saying that this is happening on a cultural scale. And I think here, like, this is kind of what seems like where we should be plateauing to. Like, and we really have to be uncertain about certain things, especially the social or the models that we use on a social scale the kind of processes uh you could look anywhere i mean there was a there was a call recently on uh the edu like reforming the education system um i think we're really in a period where we have to 
um, kind of dip here and realize that we don't really know how to do a lot of things as like even how to like structure our daily lives essentially to a large degree like so many of the the systems that are in place although they might claim to be operating effectively and of course they're they're not entirely bad but um i think they really like a lot of the basic assumptions about how to organize our lives kind of have to be put under have to be kind of challenged um so kind of going on a little more i think this was kind of addressed actually um but yeah the dunning kruger effect kind of on this global scale or at least that's kind of what my other researcher was arguing and i kind of agree especially as it relates to disciplinary kind of knowledge production and what what i mean by that is basically the way the university system is structured so like any particular university it could be yukon um where i did my undergrad um basically uh hold on i see there's some stuff in the chat um but this idea that universities kind of know are, are so certain about the knowledge that they produce especially in a particular discipline um but don't really aren't really able to take into account a lot of these basic problems or yeah problems that should be solved like um how to be an autonomous person for example how to gain autonomy in your life um and I guess we can go on to the next part. I think the dimensions of uncertainty were kind of explored a little more in the quotes and we can move on to the next part. Um, yeah, so I put this here to kind of contrast the ways that people tend to think they're right. And I think this, I'll use, it's funny how you brought up American politics, Alex, because I think I will kind of continue to use that as an example. They, I mean, they always assume that they're right. Like any politician, it's like impossible to be wrong if you're a, a politician. Um, they're the way that they just communicate. It's uh, not only do, do they are they not comfortable with with being wrong or open minded. It's like being right and wrong is what constitutes their whole conversation it's like somebody is right and somebody you know, is... i'm making you on on that though mm -hmm. matthew I, 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 you can't yeah. what they say yeah isn't what they believe what they say yeah. Yeah. is what they want to say in order to mm -hmm. keep the supporters funding them right so it's mm -hmm. not you know it, it's not a case of right or wrong it's mm -hmm. i'm saying what i need to get the money in from the supporters Right. Whatever. Right, right. It's, right. It's, yeah. I, that's, yeah. Right. And that's a great point, actually, because it's 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 not they're not even saying what they think is right. Yeah. They're just saying, like, this is my this there's this is one school of thinking. This is the other school of thinking. And one of them is right, one of them is not right. I, I would I would say at least that, yeah. that that's how it works. Yeah. Right, it, right, it, right, and, right and wrong isn't 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 the question at all. It's um, mm -hmm. what what do you want to hear? I'll tell mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. That's true, and it, it does also come down to that degree to like being a winner or a loser. And it's like, how do you say? I often think like American political debates really mirror like WWE like wrestling match like matches because it, it is just this like uh kind of just they're going at each other like mindlessly kind of to some degree it's not even like there's no civility in what they're doing and it's like there's such a theatrical element to it as well it's like it's kind of wild um to a large degree um that's a great point though that is a really great point um and i think like the public space generally speaking is just not comfortable with being uncertain or open-minded and i think that's kind of like the main point that i would or one of the main things that i would kind of suggest 
here in this presentation that like generally speaking the capacity to have like uh like open-minded fluid and like socratic conversation in the public space is is really kind of i wouldn't say it's impossible by any degree but it's like really it's not very common i would say especially in the u.s um and i think a really important question to ask is how do you create uh these like pattern languages for making conversations more open-minded and accessible for a lot of different people for a lot of different perspectives like you were saying before and like how do you how do you how do you let like public discourse breathe basically because it seems like it's it's not really breathing it's kind of just i'm right i'm right i'm right and there's there's no really there's not a sense of open-mindedness um in my opinion um so and yeah and i think it's kind of on a social level as well like i was saying like it's embodied in the individual where it's like i'm right and this is what i think and i can't read like they're not a lot of people aren't comfortable with with being wrong and i, I didn't cite it here but there's a lot of like research on uh apparently like this like the psychological um effects of being certain that it gives a sense of like safety to people um but it's also on this like social scale. And I think that's kind of more of an important thing to point out where um, it's kind of a place where, yeah, public discourse can't really breathe. And I think that kind of gets to the point I, I did, as I mentioned before, it kind of reminds me of a wrestling match to a, lot, to a large degree. Um, the other hand, like the more Socratic method um, would be like a conversation is more of a discovery and more of a mutual learning process where you don't go into it thinking I'm right. And this is like, this is my ideological worldview or this is my worldview. This is your worldview. And instead it's more of a, a learning process between the two. Um, and in order to do that, it requires some immersion. I would say to some degree, you kind of have to get immersed in, um, in the conversation sorry i just want to check the time real quick because i don't have my phone on me um do you have the time laura don't want to i don't want to yeah you have about like five more minutes because we started wow. at five more so minutes have, like, if you want if you want to have like that's wild i have like 30 more slides um i'll be quick i'll be quick um yeah the socratic method is a lot better um there's also a particular way to be uncertain, I would say. Um, like, for example, we're in an ecological crisis. That's pretty obvious. Um, but there are other things that you can be uncertain about. And the thing that... Um, there are some examples of that, about this that, I, that I'll discuss real quick. Like at Life Itself, recently, some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, for example, like, what does it mean what does moral development look like? What does it actually look like? And what, it, what is the good life, I guess? Um, how do you reform educational systems? Um, how do you bridge science and meditative practices? Um, I think these are questions, these are the kinds of ways that we should foster um, uncertainty because um, I don't know. I mean, I think they're like really open-ended questions which don't have a particular answer, I would also say. I think it requires the integration of a lot of different viewpoints. Um, like what is a good life, for example? I, I wouldn't say that that's like the same for every single person. So in, in these kinds of cases, you would want to develop uncertainty, in my opinion. Um, a quick review on transdisciplinarity. Um, there are generally, and I'll go, I'll go really fast. There's generally three different types of transdisciplinarity um the first is just the critique of the like contemporary education structure the higher education structure um this is called transgression where people just say disciplines by themselves aren't able to like solve wicked problems for example um the nicolescu kind of school i guess is more focused on like the concepts that can be transdisciplinary and for example it would be like systems language which can be applied 
to biology. It can be applied to economics or politics, like all things kind of, I mean, I hesitate to say all things, but you could pretty much say like a lot of things operate as systems and kind of this Nicolescu school is more focused on how to get concepts which can bridge disciplines, which would be like, you know, applied in politics, but also in, in like biology or chemistry. And chemistry is actually a really interesting one because a lot, a lot more, um, many of these processes operate from things you learn in chemistry. So that's really interesting. Um, the Zurich school is more focused on like incorporating stakeholders and solving wicked problems. So these are kind of the three different like schools of transdisciplinarity, generally speaking. Um, I would suggest that like the transdisciplinary project is really about kind of reassessing how to produce knowledge. Um, and when I say knowledge, I really, I might talk about this later if we have time, I don't think we will, but kind of moving, um, actually how, how many more minutes do we have, Lauren? Um, probably, like you probably have a couple more minutes, but I mean, we're gonna go into a discussion so we can kind of open it out. Great. Um, um, if you wanna carry on. Okay. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I'll kind of just say that I think transdisciplinarity is concerned with this movement from um, the mechanistic worldview, which views knowledge as like more of an object. Like um, you could just take history for an example. And it, it's like a really easy example, but like, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence was signed on this day for, or something. Or like an example from, from chemistry, like, you know, a helium particle has, or a helium atom has like these kinds of, this amount of electrons, for example. So it kind of views knowledge as like something you can objectively know, I guess, um, which is generally about a specific question. Um, and that question or that, statement about something would be in a particular disciplinary field like political science or biology or math i mean it could be could be any discipline um but it really views knowledge as or yeah i, I guess knowledge um as like something that you learn and you know copy down from the whiteboard or, or whatever um this relational worldview um, is more so concerned with kind of the process of of knowing, I would say. Um, and it's really that kind of, um, as going back to like the transdisciplinary slide, it's it's kind of trying to, I would say like that transdisciplinary research is really kind of in this like epistemological kind of, I, I definitely wouldn't say crisis, but it's kind of, it's discovering itself, I would say, in the sense that it is really concerned with what does it mean to know? What are like, how should knowledge or knowing be produced in institutions? And how can that be applied to like solve particular problems, for example, like wicked problems mostly? Um, it's usually framed in this kind of wicked problem, uh, you know, space where it's like transdisciplinary uh, research is the only way to like tackle sustainability um, or tackle like an ecological crisis. And it, I think that's kind of its origin story too, where it was like, uh, just to take like the ecological crisis as one example, it's like, it's, it's not a political issue. It's not an environmental issue. It's not an economic issue. It's kind of an issue that's, you know, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. Um, so I would suggest that, or I think that transdisciplinary or this kind of relational worldview is really concerned with trying to get a sense for what it, what knowing is as, as especially like as it's embodied as in your own skin, what it means to know something, not like, 
knowing that this flower is red, for example, but like the feelings associated with knowing and learning and the process of, of knowing. Um, and particularly in different contexts. So instead of saying like, uh, this is the way the world works, it's kind of more context dependent. Um, and I guess we are kind of a little short on time. Sorry, I was sorry I took 20 minutes on the first two slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can open it out and see if anyone has any questions or any thoughts or comments. Um, I mean, I saw a slide you went through really quickly, which had four ways of knowing on it, which yeah. I thought might be quite useful for us to have a look at um, around the topic of knowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, this guy, I'll say it real quick, is at Life Itself, I think like right now, I think he's his name is John Verveke, I think. Um, but Life Itself is doing like a like a some kind of elder retreat and he's there. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but the four ways of knowing are from this guy, John Verveke. And basically he just, he, he's kind of in the same trend or he's getting, he's like skirting the disciplinary ways of knowledge and saying that there are four different ways that you can know, or there's like four different types of knowing. So instead of like, knowledge about biology, knowledge about political science, the four ways of knowing are like the four kind of ways that knowing occurs in, in the human body, I guess. Um, the first kind would be the propositional kind, which is like the disciplinary, kind of what I was talking about before, where it's like, oh, this cup is orange or, um, you know, lemon is like a citrus fruit, for example. Um, procedural knowing is more like uh, how to dance or something, uh, how to, which is really, really important. Um, procedural knowing um, kind of emphasizes the process of knowing. Perspectival is more in the empathy uh, kind of style where it's like, what what is it like to take other people's perspectives as well as combine perspectives or integrate perspectives? Um, participatory is really is knowing by being which is in my opinion kind of a really complex category that I don't fully understand um, but it, it really has to do with uh, like actually being there in the moment and participating I guess which it's almost like it is the thing itself sort of it's like the process itself so kind of hard to understand um yeah i think it it is and it is a really kind of interesting uh setup that he has here nice and in relation to uncertainty is there one of those four ways that seems to trip people up more or have a, a more mm. negative impact or people seem to be like mm. more shaken by or even the opposite can embrace uncertainty mm -hmm. more within one of those yeah that's that's a great question um i didn't think about that um i think it's more so just uh how can we include more participatory knowing and perspectival and even procedural um and i think like the idea that propositional knowing and we can be so certain about the world operating a certain way it's kind of like to go back to that Lao Tzu quote, of course, there are things that we can be certain about. I mean, like, there's no question there, but um, this idea that we can be so certain, and that's like the whole picture we have of the world, um, this propositional, or at least that's what universities kind of mostly teach for the most part. They say like knowing is composed of propositional, like, I guess, theories or facts or whatever. Um, and I guess being more open-minded to explore these, these other kinds of knowing in like an educational setting, especially, I think is, um, important. So I'm not sure if that like really answers the question, but that's like how I would respond. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments or any thoughts, anything you want to share? Um, Alex? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I, I think the, un the uncertainty most of the most obvious manifestation comes in the propositional knowing you know mm -hmm. we don't know what the facts are it's very confusing 
there was a uh, there was a book um uh what's it called there's the idea of of um complex object mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and there's a whole book about it I, I i'm sure the term isn't quite complex objects mm -hmm. but it's it, it's it's the idea that that there's things in the world like well, like an e an economic system it's it's, it's mm -hmm. such a complex thing no one mm -hmm. fully understands it exactly um and we're trying to say things that are true or false about it, but you can't, mm. just the very nature of it. Exactly. So yeah. I think the uncertainty element comes most mm. obviously in propositional knowing, yeah. but subtly I think it probably comes in um, the participatory and perspective, as you said. So mm. I think well, we, we, we don't know it so much, but I mm. I I. I I also have trouble quite understanding participatory, but I, my my sense of it is it's it's linked to development. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. So we can we can participate in different ways depending on our stage of development, mm -hmm. um, and we can have uncertainty there because we may be going through stage development or, or what whatever. Perspectival mm -hmm. also. Um, we can't it's very hard to take anyone else's but so we can take our own perspective obviously because we do we don't maybe realize we're taking the perspective but we are mm -hmm. um but the ability to take someone else's perspective is linked to our developmental stage mm -hmm. and um that's where uncertainty comes in i think as well because we've got our own perspective jim has got a different perspective for me um and I don't really know. I don't quite understand mm -hmm. why it's different. There's uncertainty there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, that's a great point. Um, and if I could just, uh, what you said there about like different perspectives and not knowing, that's really kind of the point of um, this paper, which Mark helped to write. And Mark's also a part of life itself. Um, but it, it's basically how, because science is always like, this is, science kind of has like a one perspective, generally speaking, and says like, this is the way the world works. Um, but this paper, uh, Epistemology for a Democratic Citizen Science, is the way in which like science can incorporate these different perspectives, because it's completely true. Like, it's like people have different perspectives, and to the degree in which it's like, uh, their like ways of being are, and their whole like way of relating to the world can be can be different and it's like how does science or how can the scientific method like incorporate different perspectives in a meaningful way um oh. so mark yeah yeah and mark um well I, I guess social science has like a whole lot of yeah you know, stuff to work out generally um, but Mark wrote this, and I think it's uh, a really, 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 really good paper. Uh, which I kind need of, to. Yeah, I, would, I need to look at that. Then. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, mm hmm. Because, like, so yeah, social sciences, I agree entirely. But if you're talking about physics, mm -hmm. is there a role for different perspectives in physics? It's mm -hmm. a great point. I don't um, think. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, I don't think there is. Right. No, there's not. There wouldn't be. And that would be a case where you kind of, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But probably, yeah, you're probably, I don't think you can really, or math, like there oh, are yes. that, that you can be certain about, right? And it's, it's like, yeah, it's yeah. not, um, it's not really, it doesn't, I guess, it doesn't depend on perspective, I guess, too much. Something, I mean, something, there's something like 19 different interpretations of quantum mechanics. So in, in terms of what the hell does it mean, mm -hmm. we have no idea. So mm -hmm. this is what the pen wrote. Like, we haven't a clue. We've got this stuff. Yeah. We've got equations. The equations are so good. They're like the hundredth decimal place, we can predict what's going to happen to the atomic scale and the, and the cosmic scale. Right. But we don't really understand what's going mm -hmm. on so I, I think another another element of of the uncertainty or of knowledge is mm -hmm. um and i i'm working through part of my book on this is is what is it how do 
what are the roles of science, philosophy, and religion? And I think we, we need to unpick those, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Because so, you know, picking up from um, uh, Bernardo Castro on, mm. on the first two. So he's, he says, and I think he's right, that this, the role of science is to say how things behave. Mm -hmm. Right. Not what they are. It can't, so the, the science will say that, I mean, it comes up with some temporary theories of what things are, but that's just, that's just temporary because we've got to, we've got to think about it in some way. So it's, um, Convenient fiction, as he calls it. So science comes up with convenient fictions that we can then feed into our mathematical models and say, this is how particles behave. Particles have properties. We don't really know what the meanings of those properties, but there are properties and we can assign values to them and we can mm -hmm. predict stuff. But, mm -hmm. but it's not the role of science to say what things are. It's the role of philosophy to say what things are, like metaphysics in particular. Metaphysics says, what, what is the nature of reality? Mm -hmm. That's the role of philosophy, not the role of science. And the role of religion, I think, is to say, and that's the and that's what it means to us as human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, so I think differentiating between those the roles of those three is really important. Otherwise, we get into a real real pickle about mm -hmm. trying to say, you know, what what can we know? What what does science tell us about what we know? What does philosophy tell us about what we know? And what does religion tell us about what we know? Mm -hmm. And they're very very different things, mm -hmm. right? Hmm. Yeah. Any anyone else want to chime in before I uh, comment? If not, I can go. Um, that's interesting because I personally I I don't uh uh use that d distinction between like science philosophy and religion i would i would probably the what the distinction that i prefer i guess is more so like science and art or like maybe yeah i guess like science and art because um i think uh what you said about science and philosophy like the science or what this guy says about science and philosophy is like um it does Science talks about behavior and then philosophy talks about the way things are. Um, and maybe this is just like kind of like a particular point. It's not like the main message here, but uh, I would say that it's kind of similar in the scientific, in the scientific, like overall mission to like what things are and how they behave are kind of uh, the same sort of question i think what things are and how they behave are, are kind of are kind of the same question um in, in my eyes at least that's that's what i would say but there are i think the important thing too is like there are things that science cannot answer and like there there we don't that science does not have the language for i think that is like really for me at least like poetry for example is like something you can yeah yeah say things about the world or a, a play or like even just uh playing like doing sports or whatever science there's something that science doesn't capture um which i i maybe that's like an obvious point for <laughs> for everyone but um, uh, i mean yeah some people would disagree with that but i think it it, it, it does seem obvious i agree mm -hmm. yeah I, I don't know who in their right mind would do that but yeah yeah, yeah i guess positivist people if, if your view of the world is pure materialism purely materialistic mm -hmm. and, and there is and, and there is nothing but matter then everything has to be explained by matter and mm -hmm. you can then make it complex and emergent and so on mm -hmm. but it still comes from matter and therefore in theory it's explainable by science because science mm -hmm. deals with matter and mm -hmm. therefore you should be able to explain poetry by mm -hmm. science right. uh, to me right. that's absurd but mm. if you're a, if you're a real hardcore materialist, in principle, it's all explainable, yeah, yeah, yeah. even with complex systems analysis. Mm. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. The um, do you know? I'm not. I don't know too much about this guy, to be honest. And like, uh, but do you know that guy, Stephen Wolfram? Um. No. Yes. Yes. He he's like this like computational wizard. Yes. Yes, but he recently wrote a book. 
where he was saying that like and kind of what we were talking about before too actually it's like the main problem that science has now and then to say, of course like i say science like in using that term lucy is like um that it needs to develop a theory of like the observer or like a perspective, um, which we were talking about before. And it's like, what does it mean to to hold a perspective about something? And I think that's like, at least that it doesn't seem like, uh, it seems like it's an open question, I think, in my opinion. And it's like such a mystery. But I, I do think like that a paper like this can in incorporate different perspectives. And at least if it doesn't have a theory about what it means to be an observer or have a perspective. I think it, it can at least uh, have a method where it incorporates different perspectives, which I think is important. I'll follow up on that because okay. there's Thank different you. angles on what on what Wolfram might have meant by that, actually. Mm -hmm. Was you talking about it from a, from, a, from, a, from a quantum mechanics point of view? Or? Um. I'm not sure, actually. Um, I think it was more from like a computation. He's like a computer science kind of guy. Uh, Jonathan, you probably know Stephen Wolfram. If you, since you were like a computer science major, he he made this like uh, website where you can just type in any, any engineering problem and it like solves. Yeah. It. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, I'll follow that up. Thank you. Thank you, for that, Matthew. Amazing. Thank also, you. Does anyone else have any questions or thoughts they want to share before we close? I'll add one, add one quick context on the Stephen Wolfram. So the language models, a lot of the, the large language models and uh, AI systems that have been built uh, recently, they're not really good with arithmetic. Um, uh, and so it's an interesting um, point that, that you guys brought up. And uh, they're, for a specific, this is like a really specific thing. The, the one of the big companies called OpenAI uh, has developed uh, GPT-3, GPT-4. They have a plugin though that allows you to connect with um, Wolfram Alpha, uh, so you can do oh. the complex and also combine that with the uh, linguistics and then the language model. That's useful. <laughs> It's disconcerting, is it, when, when you ask this system a, a, a question and it, it, it comes up with this knowledge of philosophy and sociology and science and it seems to know everything, yet it can't mm -hmm. do bloody simple arithmetic. <laughs> 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 Hang on a minute. This isn't this isn't how we work. <laughs> yeah. OK. Amazing. Thanks. Are there any any other final comments or points that people want to make or summarize from today's call? I think okay. it's fine. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, in that case, then, thank you very much, Matthew, for presenting and sharing with us today on the topic of navigating uncertainty. This call will be available live uh, probably sometime again next week. And then our next community call will be in two weeks' time. It'll be on the Wednesday, not the Thursday, um, with Bella Roberts. So um, until then, I will say thank you to everyone who's attended. And yeah, have a wonderful evening slash rest of your day, depending on where you are. Bye. Thanks, Matthew. Bye. Thanks. You guys. Thanks, Bye.